and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. I'm Ron. And I'm Jean Marie. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. On today's show, we're talking with Dr. Casey Kelly. Dr. Kelly graduated from the Ohio State University College of Medicine and completed her residency in family medicine at St. Joseph Hospital in Chicago. She's a 10-year member of the Institute of Functional Medicine, IFM. She's also a director on the board of the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society, ILADS, and she is a founding member of the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, also known as AIHM. Dr. Kelly is on the faculty at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. Good morning, Dr. Kelly. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for joining our show and taking time out of your busy day. Could you tell us a little bit more about ILADS? Sure. ILADS. ILADS is making a big difference in the tick-borne disease community. I actually sit on the board of directors. I, I just got upgraded to treasurer this year, and I'm continuously blown away by what we can do to help advance um, teaching and education about ILADS. It's, ILADS is a nonprofit international medical society, actually dedicated to teaching providers how to treat Lyme and other tick-borne infections. Um, and that includes research, education, and policy changes. And we support physicians, scientists, researchers, and other healthcare professionals. And um, we're dedicated to advancing the standard of care for Lyme and associated diseases using research and, and scientific grounded evidence to, to help treat patients better. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, that sounds like a wonderful organization. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Kelly, I have a three-part question. What are some of the most common tick-borne diseases? How common are tick-borne diseases? And finally, is the incidence of tick-borne diseases on the rise? Okay, good. Let me let me unpack this. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the most common tick-borne diseases, um, probably the most common that we all talk about is Lyme disease. And Lyme is caused by a bacteria that's called Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, there are actually multiple Borrelia species that can cause diseases in humans. There are tick-borne relapsing fevers, and there are new Borrelia species being found all the time. That kind of gets used as an umbrella term, Lyme disease, mm -hmm. to talk about these infections that come on ticks because ticks carry multiple infections, not just the Borrelia burgdorferi or other Borrelia species, but multiple other infections as well, including other bacteria, parasites, and viruses. So Lyme often gets you know, used a lot, but there are other infections as well. Um, and some of the other most common ones, at least in the Midwest where I am in Chicago, uh, are Lyme, Bartonella, which is a bacteria, Babesia, which is a parasite, and Anaplasma and Ehrlichium, which are bacterial infections as well. And they all have overlapping symptoms, mentology, so it can be kind of tricky to, to weed out what's there. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, part of the detective work that we have to do when we're dealing with these in, um, diseases. Um, they are extremely common. You know, if you, talk, if you look at the CDC, unfortunately, they are saying something like 30,000 people a year are, are contracting Lyme disease, but the actual numbers are better estimated probably closer to 400,000 a year. Wow. wow, big difference. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Big difference, big, big difference, yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not as understood as it should be in, when, and doctors aren't trained as they should be, so they get missed a lot. And when these chronic, or these acute infections, excuse me, become chronic, they become a totally different thing and can cause a whole host of issues. Um, and they are absolutely on the rise. And, and part of that is because of, global warming and, and those kind of things because ticks really only hibernate when it's frost and frozen. Okay. So they're active when it's warm outside. Sure. And so even if there's snow on the ground, but if it's not frozen, they'll still, wow. they'll still be active. I had a patient last year in December who had a tick bite. So, you know, they're out there more, um, for, you know, for multiple reasons, but that's a part of it. So these are, these are definitely on the rise and, um, and, and big problems. That's, mm -hmm. 
or not being as recognized as it should be. So, Dr. Kelly, although I'm a little bit familiar with bacterial infection spread by ticks, I was surprised to read that ticks can also spread some viruses and parasites. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Yeah. So there are other infections. Like I kind of think of it as an entourage. So Lyme kind of brings its entourage with it on these <laughs> okay. ticks. So carry other things as well. Um, Babesia, as I mentioned, is a, it's actually a parasite. It's, it's similar to malaria oh. and can cause Ooh. a whole host of issues, blood clotting issues, um, breathing issues, uh, hot sweats, night flashes, or hot flashes, night sweats. There we go. Um, and there's some other viruses. There's viruses that will come on these ticks as well, like Powassan virus, which is kind of a, a, a bigger buzzword as of late that's kind of growing um, and being spread as well. So there's other, a lot of different kinds of infections that get spread by ticks. Wow, that's surprising. Um, before I continue on our, our regular interview, I just wanted to throw in a, a statement that I think you should write a paper, uh, an information paper, to the, I guess, to the governor, who is, or to the adjutant general. Uh, Jean and I were both members of the Illinois Army National Guard for a number of years, and we trained regularly in Wisconsin. And Jean was a medic, and she has taken quite a few ticks off. Several hundred ticks. <laughs> I, I think more well, the VA well. should be hypercognitive of the fact that but not just the VA. I'm thinking foreign diseases are something you know they should be aware of because yeah, I can't even tell you how many people I've removed ticks from. I've right. removed and, ticks from and who every follows part, of the, up? part of the body. Right, and who follows up on that? Right. So anyway, I think uh, maybe an information paper, a white paper to let them know how big of a problem this is and that what they should be aware of. All right, now I'm back on track. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thankfully, in Illinois, actually, in, in our Illinois government, they are making some good strides and, and passing some laws and bills to get more education and, and more knowledge and more treatment options available for patients in Illinois. We're leading the charge in that in a lot of ways. Um, I'm actually, um, I get to talk with a scientist, um, Holly Tooten, next week, who's researching ticks in as part of Illinois state and um, going out and finding ticks and seeing what's in there and, mm -hmm. and putting it on a map so we can actually show providers that no babesia is, exists in your county. Excellent. Yeah. County Excellent. Tick. I like but, yeah. that. Right. It's fantastic. Uh, well, I know, you know, if I find a tick, I'll, I'll ask Jean to remove it. <laughs> <laughs> but as a, as, a, as, a, as a normal human, if, uh, if someone finds a tick, should they remove it themselves or should they ask a healthcare care prof professional to remove it for them? And also, should they save the tick? Yes. I mean, if you have trouble removing it, then you can always ask a health care provider. But you should be able to remove it yourself. There's lots of YouTube videos out there. Um, the trick is to get some tweezers and get you know, as close to the skin as possible at the head of the tick and pull straight up until it releases. Don't use Vaseline. Don't use flames. Just pull straight up and it will release. There's also some um, devices called tick twisters where you kind of slide it around the head and twist and pull up. And that's also really easy um, to remove it that way. Um, but as soon as you find it, the faster you can remove it, the better. Okay. And absolutely save the tick. Save the tick. You can send the tick in for testing. There are several places where you can send the tick in, um, and they'll test for multiple infections. Um, TickReport.com is one. There's another one called Ticknology.com, <laughs> and they, it's much easier. To, yeah, it's much easier to find these infections in the tick mm -hmm. than it is to find it in a human. Okay. So if you get a tick, especially if it's engorged, send it in because that way. You know, your physician can know what we're dealing with if there's any infections in that tick, and then we can better treat you. Well, that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So as a follow-up to that, doctor, what are some indications that someone has contracted a tick-borne disease? You mentioned about, what is it, uh, being engorged? That the tick, not right. you. No, I know. The, oh, okay. But, but again, the tick is... <laughs> I think that's a different episode. Oh, okay. But no, if the tick is engorged, but I mean, what are some of the things um, that you? So, in other words, like you want to know, yeah, like you want to know whether or not you caught something right. after you got right. bit by the tick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
I, you know, I wish it were super simple and black and white to answer that. Um, certainly the longer the tick has been on you, the bigger the risk that it has transmitted something to you. And there's various different research out there as far as how long it takes that tick to transmit an infection to you, be it as short as 10 minutes, up to 24 hours. There's kind of a, a broad range out there. So that's why I said the sooner the better, get it off. Um, the kind of quintessential pathognomonic Lyme disease um, sign is a bullseye rash. So if you develop a bullseye rash, and it's not painful, it's not itchy, um, it's shaped like a bullseye, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, if you see that, that is Lyme disease. Nothing else does that. You need to get treated for 30 days with an antibiotic to help prevent this from becoming chronic. Um, the other sign, though, a lot of people never see a rash. Mm -hmm. or never get a rash. Right. A lot of people actually never see a tick, for that matter, which makes it all that more complicated. But the acute symptoms, generally speaking, for, for Lyme, as well as uh, most of the co-infections, are more of a flu-like illness. So sometimes a fever, fatigue, joint pain and swelling can also be a big part of that, especially if it moves around. So it's your knee and it's your elbow. Oh, and wow. Ankle. Um, those are good signs that you've got a tick infection. So the problem is most people, like I said, don't see the tick. They don't see the rash. They get, you know, a flu-like illness that can be pretty mild. It goes away and they seem like they're fine. They just think that they, you know, caught a virus or something, got the flu or whatnot. But it's not super typical to get those flu-like illness symptoms in the middle of the summer. So okay. that can be a sign. You know, 2020 has been a a little weird right, for that. Right, right. 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 <laughs> you know, typically, that doesn't happen. Um, you know, the the other issue though is these chronic issues. So if you don't catch it right away, it can develop into these a whole host of different symptoms in different people. It's it's really the great Lyme is really the great mimicker. So people can pre present with multiple sclerosis like symptoms, with wow. rheumatoid arthritis, with chronic fatigue. And so it can be really, really tricky to figure out if that's what happened. But, you know, if you've been sick for two, three, five, 20 years and no one can figure it out and all of your labs are normal, that's when it's absolutely worth looking at these infections as an underlying cause. Okay, that's great advice. Is, is there actually a blood test that they could run then at that point and say, you know, we've done everything else, but then we could run this particular blood test to see it was a tick? You can try, although the testing for Lyme is very gray. Unfortunately, that's part, another big hiccup in this tick-borne world is that the testing for it is rather difficult. And that's where the research is coming really in, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, you know, perfect black and white test. So Lyme disease, you could do a Western blot test. Um, a lot of people will get the screening antibody test or a screening test, which is a horrible test. It misses over half the people but that will come back negative so their doctor won't do any more testing. So the Western blot, at the very least, is a test that needs to be run to try to figure out if Lyme is an underlying culprit. Okay, thank you. And what treatments are available to treat these tick-borne diseases? There, uh, you can always start with antibiotics. There are a host of herbal antibiotics. And when it comes into this chronic world, it becomes a lot more complex. And so a full treatment plan, really, you, I, you know, I'm a little biased because I myself have been, I am an integrative medicine doctor. I have my sort of board certification in family medicine, as well as integrative medicine and integrative medicine looks at the system as a whole and tries to get down to the why, why people are sick. And so when dealing with these chronic infections, it's not like you can just take a medicine for two weeks and be done with it. It takes a lot more than that. You're often on antibiotics for months, for weeks, for years. Um, and there's a lot of repair that has to be done as well, gut healing, neurological support. It's, it's pretty complex and complicated. It can be done and it can take a while, but people, we can really ge regain health if we look at the system as a whole. You know, the, the little asterisk next to that is if you are quote unquote lucky enough to see a tick and get a bullseye rash and get medicine immediately, then, you, then that might be able to be done. You take your meds for a month and you can kind of hopefully be done with it. But it's the chronic infections that take a lot more time to really treat and heal. 
mm-hmm. there are treatments. There's a lot of different things out there. A lot of docs get pretty creative with the different ways that we can help with um, herbs and IVs and, and supplements um, to help people heal and repair from this. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I guess then um, the goal should really be not getting bit by a tick. So my question yeah. is, um, <laughs> how can we avoid contracting tick-borne illnesses and how can we avoid tick bites? That, yeah, that is a great question and a great point because prevention is key. Um, I don't ever want people to feel afraid or scared to go outside and, and a lot of Lyme patients you know, have that fear. When you know they see the woods, they get scared because that's mm-hmm. what made them sick, right? But I think if we're prepared, um, we can still go out inside and enjoy enjoy being in nature. You can start by spraying your clothes. So you can buy permethrin mm-hmm. at any um, sporting goods store and spray your clothes, your socks, your shoes, your pants, um, your hat, and spray them down outside in a well ventilated area. Let them dry. And those will usually, that permethrin is a, a bug repellent. And that will last about six washes or so on your clothes. Oh. Then you also need to use some safe, non-toxic tick sprays on your skin. So permethrin is not skin safe if you just spray it on your skin. But there are, are some tick repellents. Um, Ranger Ready is a good brand. You can also find um, some with lemon eucalyptus oil. Those are non-toxic for your skin. So spray your skin with the bug spray. That's safe. And then you have to be just super, super hip and tuck your pants into your socks. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's really awesome. Um, if you have long hair, wear a hat. Um, and then, you know, after you're out and you enjoy your time, then you need to do a tick check afterwards. And, mm-hmm. you know, look in all the crevices behind your ears and your scalp. And um, they can be extremely tiny which is why if you wear the repellent, you're going to help reduce that. But then do a tick check afterwards. Um, and generally speaking, if you find anything, you'll find it fast enough so that it's not a problem uh, in that case. And then you can help prevent being bitten by a tick in the first place. Okay. And yes. I know when we take our dogs for a walk in the forest, when we come back, we always do a tick check because um, they're so low to the ground and we have found um, ticks on more than one occasion. And we don't want them to yeah, snuggle up in bed point. with us. <laughs> and then the tick falls off and yeah. then looks oh, for something mm-hmm. else to eat. Yeah. 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 And if you, if you let your dogs into your bed and then the other tick, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Great point. Check your dogs. Get your dogs to the vet to get tick prevention as well. How long do ticks live? Oh, that's a great question. They're pretty indispensable. <laughs> or, um, they, they um, yeah. I've heard that they can um, live in water and all these other things, but they they last for quite a while. They're kind of like cockroaches. Okay, okay. All right, good to know. No, it's not good to know. <laughs> no, it is good to know. <laughs> cockroaches wow. of the forest. Yeah, Wonderful. wow. So, Dr. Kelly, uh, this is all interesting stuff. What actually drove your interest in getting into medicine in the first place? Yeah, you know, I've always been one of those kids who liked going to the doctor, which is, you know, odd for a small child, but I was always into science. I was always into helping people. Mm-hmm. And so I got interested in being a doctor when I was really young. So it was a, a lifelong kind of goal um, okay. for me. Okay. Yeah. And well, it's actually good. There's a lot of people that don't know what they want to do right. early on. You did. That's great. I still don't know what I want to do. <laughs> Too late. And how about you? <laughs> you're a podcaster. And how about uh, your interest in integrative health in particular? Yeah, so integrative health, I, I started to kind of dive into a little bit once I was in med school. Um, I... I had some trouble kind of understanding why we weren't asking why people were sick. So we were very good at diagnosing people, putting a name on things, and then giving them medicine for that. And then we would have to give them medicine for the side effects for the medicine we gave them for, you know, the first thing we Mm -hmm. diagnosed. But no one was asking why they were sick, especially with these chronic complex illnesses. And, you know, going into primary care, you're, you know, you're, you're dealing with these you know, families and lifelong care of their health and not, you know, just a broken foot, which, you know, Western medicine is great for, you know, that kind of thing. But I just really struggled with the why. And, you know, I kept digging a little bit farther and I started to learn more about you know, nutrition and supplements. And 
in residency, I, I dug even farther into that world and, and realized there was these groups of doctors out there who had been doing this for a while who were looking at the why, who were really trying mm-hmm. to figure out why people were sick. Um, and I also, I mean, I had some of my own medical issues as well that started when I was in my teens and 20s that weren't getting answered by the general conventional mindset, um, tried different medicines and different therapies and nothing was really working. And so, you know, my own health was also driving this search for why, why am I sick? Why does this feel horrible? Um, and you know, you just, at that point it was a lot of self talk. So I had to go to conferences. I had to go learn on my own this different aspect, um, and approach to medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I myself was diagnosed with Lyme disease, um, probably eight to 10 years ago at this point. Uh, and through that journey, that's really how I got into to treating Lyme patients, um, was through my own self journey and healing, helping heal myself from that and learning how to help other people. Well, that's great. You've actually been there and done that and walked in, you know, Walk those shoes. Yeah, walked in those shoes. And yeah, I think that can make you a more empathetic care provider as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Kelly, what advice do you have for those that are interested in pursuing a career in medicine? And also, what advice do you have for recent medical school graduates? Especially during COVID. Yeah, especially <laughs> during these interesting times. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine being in school during COVID. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of mind boggling. But, um, you know, I, there's so many different types of medical providers nowadays. Um, you know, physicians are, are one, but there's you know, acupuncturists, there's nurse practitioners. You know, there's there's so many different aspects to it. Medical school is not easy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard. It's mm-hmm. really, really hard. And you really have to, to know, I think, that that's really, really what you want to do. Mm-hmm. If you're interested in helping people, my first advice would say, you know, great awesome look at all the different roles that are available out there and see if there's one that may fit you better your personality your your lifestyle better than being a doctor right you might find that going to PA school might be a lot better Mm -hmm. um so you know look for that um and then as far as advice for recent medical school graduates um or even you know current medical students and things I think learning how to gain some resiliency and some self-care and making sure you learn how to not burn out Mm -hmm. is important and it often gets overlooked um, with doctors. Doctors make the worst patients. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily (laughs) take care of ourselves very well. And so learning those skills is extremely, extremely important and it will help you be a better doctor if you help protect yourself and fill your cup up. Mm-hmm. But don't forget to take care of yourself. That's my advice. Good advice. Yeah, mm-hmm. wonderful advice. Uh, Dr. Kelly, what has helped you get through the challenges that this year has posed? Well, you know, a lot of that goes back to the resiliency and the self-care. Um, and so, you know, I have to make it a daily work to make sure that I'm taking care of myself as well. Um, cause it's, it's been a very stressful year. I, I started my practice, Case Integrative Health, um, in March of 2019 or May of 2019, excuse me. And so, you know, we just got into our new space and everything was up and running right when COVID hit. Mm-hmm. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. wow. Like, wow. Um, and you know, I have a three-year-old, I have a husband, I have a dog, you know, I've got all these other things going on too. So I have to make it a point to practice self-care. I have to, you know, practice what I preach. I have to eat well. I have to exercise and, and meditate. I wake up early every day so I have time for myself. Mm-hmm. Try to get myself prepared and prepped for my day so that I can be the best, you know, best version of me that I can be. Um, and kind of working through that and, and just trying to be flexible and adapt to this crazy world we live in and try to take it all um, as an adventure mm-hmm. and with a little bit of humor as possible and just kind of try to get through this is this has been a tough one for yeah. sure <laughs> yeah definitely yeah. um what final tips hints or helpful advice do you have for our listeners i think it kind of goes back to um 
the, what I was just talking about, you know, making sure there's time for yourself. I think what I'm seeing in, in my patient, in my patient base who, you know, our patients who have these chronic complex illnesses, you know, I keep reminding everybody to, to give yourself grace because there's extra stress this year mm-hmm. and, you know, focus on the small wins, even if they seem small, you know, celebrate the victories, you know, celebrate the good stuff um, so that we can, you know, survive a little bit better. Um, hug your loved ones because touching is really important. So if, if you have people in your bubble, make sure you're, you're giving them hugs and, mm-hmm. and lots of love. Um, and when it comes to, you know, not just Lyme disease, but chronic complex illnesses in general, like if you are struggling with something, you know, deep down that something is wrong. You're not making this up. It's not that you need to go to a psychologist. Um, not that there's anything wrong with going to a psychologist or psychiatrist. That's absolutely a full part of all, all of our healing. Mm-hmm. But you know it's more than that. Like if you know deep down that something's going on and every doctor you've been to is, keeps brushing you off or, or saying there's, there's nothing wrong with you because your labs are normal, keep digging. Look into integrative medicine, functional medicine. Try to find a practitioner near you that will listen, that will take the time to sit and listen to you and help you figure out the best way to heal Excellent. Yeah, we're yes, all we're is. all sitting here nodding <laughs> our, our heads. heads. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> trying to trying to figure out how far is her practice. <laughs> Actually, not far from us at all. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And thanks to COVID, we do a lot of telemedicine mm-hmm. nowadays. Sure. Um, so a lot of virtual visits, um, and you know, we've been able to kind of open up in a lot of ways because of that. Um, I guess that's a little bit of a silver lining to all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're able to reach patients all over the country, actually, which has been really, really fun. Excellent. Yeah, that's fantastic. And how can our listeners and new patients that want to join your <laughs> practice uh, find out more about you and your practice? Sure. Yeah. I mean, check us out on the internet, caseintegrativehealth.com. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. And, you know, our phone number for office is 773-675-1400. You can always give us a call. Um, and you can email us to support at caseintegrativehealth.com. Thank you Fantastic. very much. We're going to put a link for that on our website. Yes. And then also in our phone book. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So um, on behalf of Jean Marie and Lita, uh, Dr. Kelly, we want to thank you so much for coming on this morning and enlightening us with all the information. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. If our listeners have any questions or comments related to today's show, they could drop us a line at podcastdx at yahoo.com through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. I don't know why you looked at me when you said that. Because I I don't know where that (laughs) came from. And if you have... (laughs) And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. And as always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health care providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new health care regime. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this podcast. Till next week.